fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So unpopular, it is called in the Bible the Elijah message. It is uncompromising. It is a straight message. Even austere, difficult, hard, strict Elijah message. Now, in the book of Revelation, the apostate Christian world is referred to as Jezebel, the woman who lived in Elijah's time. Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians. She married Ahab and led him to worship Baal, and led the children of Israel to the altar and to the grove, so that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord than all the kings before him, according to 1 Kings 16. Ahab, the state, became a tool in the hand of Jezebel, a tool, a pawn in her hand, and at her instigation brought death to the servants of God. The Bible says Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, 1 Kings 18, 4 and 13. Now, Jezebel was a queen. She didn't go out and personally kill these people. What she did was to employ the awesome power of the state to do it. There is an analogy here, and I want us to see it. Before we get to it, however, let me point out that Elijah was raised up to counteract this sinful, wicked foolishness. And Elijah was no namby-pamby ecumaniac who was so anxious to be popular and to please everybody that he didn't get his job done. Oh no, with the irresistible power of heaven, he challenged the false teachings of Jezebel and of Baal worship and revealed to the people the iniquity of that awful woman working through Ahab. Now let us consider the analogy. In these closing scenes of earth's history, the devil will take complete control. In Great Controversy, page 528, we're told that Satan determines to unite them, meaning all these apostate and paganistic powers. He is determined to unite them into one body 
and thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. You see, my friends, in order to mount the persecution he has planned, in order to get human beings to do all the terrible things he has in mind, the devil has to bring about blinding deception. And spiritualism is necessary to this deception. And there will be then a union of church and state. Jezebel typifying the church. Ahab typifying the state. A marriage of the two. Jezebel and Ahab will unite against the people of God. And my question tonight is, where is Elijah? With his uncompromising message. With the truth without compromise, held up plainly and boldly and strictly before the people. There's going to come a time so terrible that pen cannot describe it, the servant of the Lord says. And this is the time when God's people are craving smooth, happy talk. And we're paying the price. In 2 Corinthians 10, 12, it speaks of those who measure themselves by themselves. When we want to see how well we're doing, we don't look to Christ and the cross. We look at each other. And if I'm better than Brother Brown or Sister Smith, then I must be doing all right. In the second volume, Mrs. White says, Some are no more prepared for the coming of the Lord than the devil himself. And in the fourth volume, page 13, she says that, if their sins are reproved, then they rebel. Preach a straight sermon and they get mad. There was a time when a preacher who preached the truth was taken out and beaten and possibly burned at stake by the outside. Today, as he does that, he falls into disrepute amongst those on the inside. No wonder the Lord says when the storm breaks that God's people will be persecuted by former brethren. And then I read in testimonies to ministers that the Spirit of God is departing from among His people, and many have entered dark and slippery places never to return. These are they who give hospitality to seductive and clever philosophies. Today, some of the most awful perversions are being practiced, even advocated, amongst God's people. And there is contempt for truth when it comes straight. Ladies and gentlemen, what can we do in a world like this? Go along with the world so that we don't cause any ripples? Oh, no. We ought to live so God can pour out the Holy Ghost upon us. And then we are told in the sixth volume, page 436, endowed with the Holy Spirit, we'll be able to counteract the demoralizing movements of the world. Let's look at our analogy a little further. Jezebel marries Ahab, the union of apostate Jezebel with the state. I should say states, for we are told that other governments will follow the lead of the United States. Let's look at number two, a false priesthood. Priesthood will take the place of God. And this is happening today as men are assuming the prerogatives of God and casting aside the Word and exalting their own ideas in the place of the Word of God. In the book of 1 Kings 18 and verse 18, we read that in Ahab's time they forsook God's law. And Daniel said that in the last days they would change God's law. Then they turned to Baal worship, which is sun worship, that form of worship that has always stood foremost as the antithesis of true worship, and in our day, the Son's Day observance prevails. For three and a half years, there came a drought. God's judgment, not to destroy, but to arouse and to awaken. Three and a half years, 1260 literal days, analogous to the 1260 prophetic days of spiritual drought spoken of by Daniel and the revelation. And then we read that Jezebel stirred up Ahab. She challenged him. She appealed to his ego, appealed to his pride, and stirred him up until he authorized the destruction of God's people. 
And in these last days, the states will be stirred up by the Jezebel, the spiritual Jezebel, to do the same thing. We do read, however, that Jezebel, just before she was hurled to her death, painted her face in order to present herself most attractively to Jehu in the hope of turning him aside from his duty. And we're told that this great spiritual harlot will put on a display, making herself attractive, so that people in God's true church will develop some kind of inferiority complex, and the grass will appear greener on the other side of the street, and we'll stand back coveting what's happening elsewhere. Oh, I know this is tough, and I've thought about it, and prayed about it, but it's happening. I hope not here, but I travel enough to know that it's happening. We're told that all the candles and all the liturgy and all the surpluses and all the paraphernalia and all the ceremony and all the stained glass and all these other trappings are fascinating to the human mind. Some of us can't stay away and wonder why we don't have it here. Why aren't our churches darker with candles burning? Ellen White says, because demons like that, our churches should be fully lighted. But we want to be like them. Oh, but we read further that the prophets of Baal were destroyed down by the brook Kishon. And in Judges, Kishon is called the waters of Megiddo referring to the destruction of those who opposed the truth of God in the battle of Armageddon. Elijah was called up to restore the true worship of the true God. And in Malachi 4, we are told that God will raise up Elijah again, referring to the Elijah message before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. There's something else in this analogy. Elijah was translated. This Elijah faithful to his duty. This Elijah, uncompromising in principle. This Elijah, who told God's will and let the chips fall where they would. This Elijah, who stood for something while others were bowing down to Baal. This Elijah was translated. And God has a people who will be translated, who will not see death in these last days, but I've already told you, they're not going to be ordinary folks. They're going to be extraordinary. It is significant further that Elijah's translation came shortly after the priests of sun worship were slain. And the translation of God's remnant people, according to Great Controversy 656 and 7, will be translated after the false prophets are set upon by those whom they have deceived. And so the analogy is very clear. Jezebel came into Israel's history because she was an agent of the devil. And she came to pervert and debauch and ruin and reproach the people of God. And when Elijah came with the truth, he did not flatter her and she was not pleased with him. Instead, the spirit of prophecy says, she was enraged by the truth and the straight testimony of Elijah, so much so that she sought to put him to death. And I wish we would learn that, and don't you think for a moment I have a martyr complex. I don't. I believe in diplomacy, and I believe in tactfulness, and we who do evangelism have to believe that, or you don't baptize anybody. But I do believe that the straight message God has given to us must be preached, and I believe that message has its time right now. If you believe that, would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, that's what I believe as the storm approaches. It did not make Jezebel feel good to hear Elijah preach straight. It enraged her. And now listen to early writings, page 279. The last great warning had sounded. It stirred up and enraged the inhabitants of earth who would not receive the message. Now, that's the point. It does not enrage everybody. It enrages those who are brought to decision. And there is a song we sing in here that is powerful. It says, once to every man and, man and nation comes the moment to decide. 
And when the truth comes face to face with a person and he has his rendezvous with God, if he rebels against God, and this is what brings God's contempt upon man, nobody is condemned for being in darkness. The Bible says so. The Bible says this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light. God does not condemn a man for being in darkness. That man is condemned when light comes to dispel darkness, but he chooses darkness instead of light. And so as men come to that moment to decide, when the truth for a moment is clear, when the truth for a moment is brought to their hearts, and they decide, I don't want it, then they are enraged, and not until then. And so we can preach God's word and we can witness God's word and we can live God's word without fear of offending. A man is not offended until he consciously rejects the truth of God. And then he will be enraged. So be it. What can we do about that? We are not sent to flatter, but to enrage. This message began in stress. It's going to end in distress, for it contains a final warning to a lost world. And we do it with the consciousness that the Spirit of God is being withdrawn. And we will watch spiritualism possess men's souls. And if you can't see that today, I'd like to know what's wrong with you. Now, you know I don't go to the movies, but if you sit watching the news, they intersperse these ads of movies that are being made, and it's gotten to the place nearly everyone is either the, the, the sensuality of Sodom or the spiritualism of Babylon. Every movie they make, and the devil is indoctrinating and educating the people with it, and he's doing it with television. He started off with innocuous little programs like My Mother the Car and Bewitched, cute little comedies, and he graduated to Dark Shadows and Night Stalker. And people today are wide open for Eastern mysticism and, and spiritual. And I want to throw in one more, possessionism. And I use that term, I use that term for our benefit tonight. Uh, if I'm reading this paper correctly, it says... Uh, spiritual growth seminars for God's church. And I want to use this word possessionism, which embraces all kinds of uh, religious fatism, mistaken for the Holy Spirit, another spirit actually possesses and manipulates, says a psychiatrist who studied it, manipulates. The physical bodies of those who are being deceived to the point of ecstasy. And that's about as clear as I can be with a mixed congregation. Are you listening to me? It is nothing short of spiritualism with its glossolalia to be followed by the shaking judgments of God the Sabbath of God, and the Sunday issue made plain. This is the point where men receive the mark of the beast or the seal of God. And the outpouring of God's Spirit upon the church, the church in court, by the way, witnessing where it should not have had to witness. And large numbers will be gathered to the kingdom. The Spirit of Prophecy speaks of hundreds of thousands. And the gospel will go forth in its spirit and the work will be finished. Listen to this statement as we come near to the end of our message. God keeps an account with all nations. The account remains open. But when the figure reaches a certain amount which God has fixed. You see we don't control this. God does. No nation knows when it's gone too far. And I'll be honest with you. I love America. But I fear for America. We were first secularized and now we're being paganized. The account remains open, but when a figure is reached, which God has fixed, the ministry of his wrath begins. The account is closed. Divine patience ceases. Volume 5, page 208. 
And the devil then will take complete control. He will even impersonate Christ, coming as the great physician. He will bring disease and a deadly taint to the air. He will heal some and leave some sick. He will prosper some and trouble others and cause them to believe that God is afflicting them. And the blame will be placed upon God's remnant church. Judgments will come upon them to arouse and awaken them. And they will come upon us too. And I think in order to put this in a more hopeful setting, I ought to refer to Paul and Silas in jail. And because of the dark providence of God which destroyed a jail, a jailer was one to Christ. I preached from the book of Philippians uh, a sermon that encouraged my own heart so much. For Paul was in jail and they sent some folk over to see about him. And the little church at Philippi that Paul had raised up was so discouraged And like a great cheer from glory came his reply to them. And Paul said, amongst other things, Look, folks, don't worry about me. And I now quote him. He says, The things that have happened unto me have fallen out rather for the furtherance of the gospel. I'm in jail, but it happened for the furtherance of the gospel. As a matter of fact, he said, My bonds are in Christ. I'm in Caesar's jail, but I'm Christ's prisoner. And he said, everything that's happened to me is for the furtherance of gospel. And when I read that, I decided to take a look and see just what Paul was talking about. And you know what I discovered? That's the truth. Paul was like some of us. He was running too much to do anything very well. Running efforts here and there and traveling and backtracking and running revivals and all that. And yet St. Paul has given us most of the New Testament. He wouldn't have written a page if he hadn't gone to jail. So the judgment that came upon him was for the furtherance of the gospel. And that's the difference between a saint and a sinner. He understands God's dark providences. You take a buzzard and put him in a cage, he'll plop down on the ground and poke his head into dark corners looking for carrion. Put an eagle in that same cage and he'll find the loftiest perch and spend his enforced leisure looking at the sun. The problem is not the cage, it's the bird on Mount Sinai is absolutely insane. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Allah. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, Hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todo. Religious leaders are gathering November 6th through the 18th for a ceremony they're calling Returning to Sinai, where they say that they're going to issue a new Ten Commandments to repent for man-made climate change. The website Interface Center for Sustainable Development has an article discussing the upcoming event titled In Sinai, a Prophetic Call for Climate Justice and Ceremony of Repentance. Mount Sinai is, of course, where Moses received the Ten Commandments, but these religious leaders are actually calling for a new universal Ten Commandments. Todos somos hijos de Dios. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. The final stage is being set in November 2022 and it will ultimately lead to the one world religion. This year, the Holy Father's message implores the world, listen to the voice of creation and hear its bittersweet song, sweetly praising the Creator, bitterly lamenting our mistreatment of nature. Very worried about this mistreatment, the Holy Father calls for bolder action from all nations during this year's COP27 and COP15 summits on climate change and biodiversity. Regarding COP27, Pope Francis again joins scientists in holding to the Paris Agreement's temperature increase goal of 1.5 degrees. The planet already is 1.2 degrees hotter. During this season of creation, may all Christians come together to celebrate the creation's sweet song and respond to creation's bitter cry. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bore them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. 
and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with Revelation 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth.
Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts, and establish you in every good word and work. We're also following the major news from the Vatican tonight. Pope Francis voicing support for same-sex civil unions, the first pope in history to do so. The pope saying homosexual people have the right to be in a family, that they are children of God. Here's our foreign correspondent, James Longman, tonight. Tonight, an historic shift from the leader of an ancient institution. Pope Francis becoming the first pope in the Catholic Church's 2,000-year history to endorse civil unions for gay couples. This is a man who cries with humanity. In the new documentary, Francesco, the pope says homosexual people have a right to be in a family. They are children of God and have a right to a family. It's a major departure from the position of the Vatican's own doctrinal office. The pope adding, what we have to create is a civil union law. That way, they are legally covered. I stood up for that. The pontiff has called for civil unions in the past, but before he became pope. The emphasis on the legitimacy of the LGBT family is also notable. Experts calling it a monumental moment. It's a real way um, of not only speaking pastorally um, to this group of people, but also uh, speaking lovingly and making them feel more welcome in the church. Conservative Catholics, though, tonight are calling for clarity. Thomas Tobin, Bishop of Providence, Rhode Island, saying the church cannot support the acceptance of objectively immoral relationships. But Francis's words are striking a chord with a younger generation. I never thought that I would see something like that in my lifetime. 29-year-old Nicholas Traxer from Minnesota says the Pope's comments speak to his heart. It's a difficult road for LGBTQ Catholics. I value my faith and my sexuality as equal parts of my identity. But it hasn't always been that way. Pope Francis has cast himself as the modernizing pope, but he's faced huge opposition from within his own clergy. This latest move could mean the biggest backlash yet, but he may feel he has no choice if he's to survive in a modern age. The 7th Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions started in Kazakhstan's capital, Nur Sultan. Pope Francis is among the guests, as well as high representatives of various religions. One of the goals of this Congress is to promote peace through dialogue. It's absolutely necessary to have a dialogue on the challenges of this world and to have a strong collective call for peace and justice in this world as well. The key for peace today in this unstable world is to engage, to talk, to be together, to try to understand each other and to know personally each other. 
and that's what can bring people together. This year's Congress brings together delegates from more than 50 countries representing different world religions. To compare with the first Congress, uh, there were only 17 delegations. Now we have more than 100 delegations. So it uh, shows uh, that uh, there is an interest in the world and there is a support of the spiritual leaders. The most important thing that is being achieved here is to normalize the conversation between different religions through their religious leaders. It is to make it popular and important for religious leaders to come together as one, which is very rare and we don't see it very frequently, but it essentially normalizes the space of convening between different religions. And in our times and in our world, that's very important. Many global challenges were raised at this Congress and the pandemic was one of them. Some of the participants said that the pandemic has clearly shown how connected human beings are, stressing that this is something many seemed to forget. Galina Pal e quindi e poi è la, la corsa della Madonna immagine per tutti ecco la corsa che parte in questo momento tutto, tutto è bene quello che finisce bene una corsa anche quest'anno brillante entusiasmante che non ha tradito le attese Vediamo l'abbraccio liberatorio dei confratelli lauretani che stringono la guida, tutta la quadriglia, un momento bellissimo qui in piazza Garibaldi, il rituale dello sparo dei mortaretti, il volo delle colombe, la caduta del manto nero del dolore che ha lasciato il posto al verde della speranza, è riuscito perfettamente, quindi complimenti alla quadriglia che quest'anno ha eseguito la corsa, una corsa che rivediamo in questo momento e la rivedremo ovviamente anche eh, nel corso di questa diretta, qualcuno l'avrà già immortalata sul web, quindi la rivedremo nei prossimi giorni, ecco l'immagine che poi resta della Pasqua sul Monese. Bellissima, bellissima questa corsa della Madonna, si sente l'alleluia di Endel, si sente questo eco di gioia, vedete qui ancora il volo delle colombe, la caduta del manto, lo sparo dei Montaretti, dritta è andata la Madonna verso la resurrezione e dice fatelo anche voi, lo faccia ciascuno che sta seguendo questa diretta, verso il Cristo e il fine della vita. Ora vedremo se possiamo raccogliere qualche umore a caldo da coloro che hanno seguito la corsa, che riproponiamo ancora in questo il momento una frazione di secondo, prima 14 secondi, forse anche meno, che però sono indimenticabili, restano scolpiti davvero nel cuore, nella memoria di tutti, quindi ovviamente l'applauso è liberatorio anche della folla perché tutti abbiamo trattenuto il fiato in attesa.
Una maestra de vida espiritual, a Puentón, una santiña a quien se recorre para obtener favores a Baixo. The Pope sat before the image of the Virgin and recited the prayer that is most notably known in Fatima, the Rosary. She's called the United Nations International Pilgrim Statue of Fatima and travels around the world. I've seen people who break down in tears as soon as they look at the face. The faithful believe they're seeing the face of Jesus' beloved Mother Mary. The theologians say it's called the aura of the Mother of God around it. That means the Mother of God's presence is with that image in such a way that you can look at other images of Our Lady and get your fill. It is one of the, say, the four original statues made under the guidance of Sister Lucia, the oldest of the three children. The three children, Lucia, Jacinta, and Francisco, said they saw an apparition of Mary while herding sheep near the village of Fatima, Portugal, May 13, 1917, and she revealed three secrets to them, including the prediction of World Wars I and II. And this is the face Lucia described. When you're looking at it, you feel her presence. You can get your fill at looking at other beautiful images, but you cannot get your fill at looking at this. You just want to look, look, and look again. Just a Mary shrine here, Mary shrine there, Mary shrine here, everywhere. Why do people praise and worship Mary, whom Jesus was born of? A famous Catholic bishop and writer, Alphonsus Liguori, explained in his writings that it is far effective to pray to Mary than to Christ. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Chapter 32 Snares of Satan The great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward for nearly 6,000 years is soon to close, and the wicked one redoubles his efforts to defeat the work of Christ in man's behalf and to fasten souls in his snares, to hold the people in darkness and impenitence till the Savior's mediation is ended, and there is no longer a sacrifice for sins, is the object which he seeks to accomplish. When there is no special effort made to resist his power, 
when indifference prevails in the church and the world, Satan is not concerned, for he is in no danger of losing those whom he is leading captive at his will. But when the attention is called to eternal things, and souls are inquiring, What must I do to be saved? He is on the ground, seeking to match his power against the power of Christ, and to counteract the influence of the Holy Spirit. The Scriptures declare that upon one occasion, when the angels of God came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan came also among them, Job 1, 6, not to bow before the eternal king, but to further his own malicious designs against the righteous. With the same object he is in attendance when men assemble for the worship of God. Though hidden from sight, he is working with all diligence to control the minds of the worshipers. Like a skillful general, he lays his plans beforehand. As he sees the messenger of God searching the scriptures, he takes note of the subject to be presented to the people. Then he employs all his cunning and shrewdness so to control circumstances that the message may not reach those whom he is deceiving on that very point. The one who most needs the warning will be urged into some business transaction which requires his presence, or will by some other means be prevented from hearing the words that might prove to him a savor of life unto life. Again, Satan sees the Lord's servants burdened because of the spiritual darkness that enshrouds the people. He hears their earnest prayers for divine grace and power to break the spell of indifference, carelessness, and indolence. Then, with renewed zeal, he plies his arts. He tempts men to the indulgence of appetite, or to some other form of self-gratification, and thus benumbs their sensibilities, so that they fail to hear the very things which they most need to learn. Satan well knows that all whom he can lead to neglect prayer and the searching of the Scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. Therefore, he invents every possible device to engross the mind. There has ever been a class professing godliness who, instead of following on to know the truth, make it their religion to seek some fault of character or error of faith in those with whom they do not agree. Such are Satan's right-hand helpers. Accusers of the brethren are not few, and they are always active when God is at work and his servants are rendering him true homage. They will put a false coloring upon the words and acts of those who love and obey the truth. They will represent the most earnest, zealous, self-denying servants of Christ as deceived or deceivers. It is their work to misrepresent the motives of every true and noble deed, to circulate insinuations, and arouse suspicions in the minds of the inexperienced. In every conceivable manner they will seek to cause that which is pure and righteous to be regarded as foul and deceptive. But none need be deceived concerning them. It may be readily seen whose children they are, whose example they follow, and whose work they do. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Matthew 7:16. Their course resembles that of Satan, the envenomed slanderer, the accuser of our brethren. Revelation 12:10. The great deceiver has many agents ready to present any and every kind of error to ensnare souls. Heresies prepared to suit the varied tastes and capacities of those whom he would ruin. It is his plan to bring into the church insincere, unregenerate elements that will encourage doubt and unbelief, and hinder all who desire to see the work of God advance and to advance with it. Many who have no real faith in God or in His Word assent to some principles of truth and pass as Christians, and thus they are enabled to introduce their errors as scriptural doctrines. The position that it is of no consequence what men believe is one of Satan's most successful deceptions. He knows that the truth received in the love of it sanctifies the soul of the receiver. Therefore he is constantly seeking to substitute false theories, fables, another gospel. From the beginning the servants of God have contended against false teachers, not merely as vicious men, but as inculcators of falsehoods that were fatal to the soul. Elijah, Jeremiah, Paul firmly and fearlessly opposed those who were turning men from the word of God. 
That liberality which regards a correct religious faith as unimportant found no favor with these holy defenders of the truth. The vague and fanciful interpretations of Scripture and the many conflicting theories concerning religious faith that are found in the Christian world are the work of our great adversary to confuse minds so that they shall not discern the truth. And the discord and division which exist among the churches of Christendom are in a great measure due to the prevailing custom of resting the Scriptures to support a favorite theory. Instead of carefully studying God's Word with humility of heart to obtain a knowledge of His will, many seek only to discover something odd or original. In order to sustain erroneous doctrines or unchristian practices, some will seize upon passages of Scripture separated from the context, perhaps quoting half of a single verse as proving their point, when the remaining portion would show the meaning to be quite the opposite. With the cunning of the serpent, they entrench themselves behind disconnected utterances construed to suit their carnal desires. Thus do many willfully pervert the word of God. Others who have an active imagination seize upon the figures and symbols of holy writ, interpret them to suit their fancy with little regard to the testimony of Scripture as its own interpreter, and then they present their vagaries as the teachings of the Bible. Whenever the study of the Scriptures is entered upon without a prayerful, humble, teachable spirit, the plainest and simplest as well as the most difficult passages will be wrested from their true meaning. The papal leaders select such portions of Scripture as best serve their purpose, interpret to suit themselves, and then present these to the people, while they deny them the privilege of studying the Bible and understanding its sacred truths for themselves. The whole Bible should be given to the people just as it reads. It would be better for them not to have Bible instruction at all than to have the teaching of the Scriptures thus grossly misrepresented. The Bible was designed to be a guide to all who wish to become acquainted with the will of their Maker. God gave to men the sure word of prophecy. Angels and even Christ Himself came to make known to Daniel and John the things that must shortly come to pass. Those important matters that concern our salvation were not left involved in mystery. They were not revealed in such a way as to perplex and mislead the honest seeker after truth. Said the Lord by the prophet Habakkuk, Write the vision, and make it plain, that he may run that readeth it. Habakkuk 2 and verse 2. The word of God is plain to all who study it with a prayerful heart. Every truly honest soul will come to the light of truth. Light is sown for the righteous, Psalm 97, verse 11. And no church can advance in holiness unless its members are earnestly seeking for truth as for hid treasure. By the cry, liberality, men are blinded to the devices of their adversary, while he is all the time working steadily for the accomplishment of his object. As he succeeds in supplanting the Bible by human speculations, the law of God is set aside and the churches are under the bondage of sin while they claim to be free. To many, scientific research has become a curse. God has permitted a flood of light to be poured upon the world in discoveries in science and art. But even the greatest minds, if not guided by the Word of God in their research, become bewildered in their attempts to investigate the relations of science and revelation. Human knowledge of both material and spiritual things is partial and imperfect. Therefore, many are unable to harmonize their views of science with Scripture statements. Many accept mere theories and speculations as scientific facts, and they think that God's Word is to be tested by the teachings of science falsely so called. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. The Creator and His works are beyond their comprehension. And because they cannot explain these by natural laws, Bible history is regarded as unreliable. Those who doubt the reliability of the records of the Old and New Testaments too often go a step further and doubt the existence of God and attribute infinite power to nature. Having let go their anchor, they are left to beat about upon the rocks of infidelity. Thus many err from the faith and are seduced by the devil. Men have endeavored to be wiser than their Creator, Human philosophy has attempted to search out and explain mysteries which will never be revealed through the eternal ages. If men would but search and understand what God has made known of Himself and His purposes, 
they would obtain such a view of the glory, majesty, and power of Jehovah that they would realize their own littleness and would be content with that which has been revealed for themselves and their children. It is a masterpiece of Satan's deceptions to keep the minds of men searching and conjecturing in regard to that which God has not made known and which he does not intend that we shall understand. It was thus that Lucifer lost his place in heaven. He became dissatisfied because all the secrets of God's purposes were not confided to him, and he entirely disregarded that which was revealed concerning his own work in the lofty position assigned him. By arousing the same discontent in the angels under his command, he caused their fall. Now he seeks to imbue the minds of men with the same spirit and to lead them also to disregard the direct commands of God. Those who are unwilling to accept the plain, cutting truths of the Bible are continually seeking for pleasing fables that will quiet the conscience. The less spiritual, self-denying, and humiliating the doctrines presented, the greater the favor with which they are received. These persons degrade the intellectual powers to serve their carnal desires. Too wise in their own conceit to search the Scriptures with contrition of soul and earnest prayer for divine guidance, they have no shield from delusion. Satan is ready to supply the heart's desire, and he palms off his deceptions in the place of truth. It was thus that the papacy gained its power over the minds of men, and by rejection of the truth because it involves a cross, Protestants are following the same path. All who neglect the word of God to study convenience and policy, that they may not be at variance with the world, will be left to receive damnable heresy for religious truth. Every conceivable form of error will be accepted by those who willfully reject the truth. He who looks with horror upon one deception will readily receive another. The Apostle Paul, speaking of a class who received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, declares, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 10 to 12. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed, a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. 
and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Instead of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb.